Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, installing wire antennas, uh, but I'm hoping that lots of people that are here will be piping up with really good suggestions that I haven't heard about. Okay. Uh, with the, and uh, I got a lot of help from the antenna team in terms of doing these things as, as well. Okay, uh, first step, safety. Okay, uh, one, of the, one of the things about installing wire antennas is that sometimes what goes up comes down. Sometimes it comes down pretty hard. Sometimes when you pull on a line, it pulls the antenna up into a tree. Sometimes it brings the tree down to the ground. Uh, or at least pieces thereof, okay. Things fall from the sky, that's that's one big risk. The other one is power lines. You do not want to have antennas, towers, equipment, anything that in any conceivable way can go and fall across a power line. The uh, the power lines in Charlottesville, if you the lower lines tend to run, I think it's 600 or 240 volts. The top line can be running at 3,000 volts. 3,000 volts will destroy your HF equipment and probably you too, okay? So it's you do not want to, you know, the safety. Think about the fact that if the power, if the tower is sprayed up, it's great, but if it falls over and it's going to hit a power line, that's a problem, okay? So... Uh, so th thanks to Ed for, for reminding me. I again. personally know two hams who were electrocuted putting up light poles. And they, the trouble is they did it by themselves. They didn't follow the scout model of the yeah. buddy system. Uh, the, um, uh, now, tools. Pocket knife for cutting, cutting lines. Got to have one of those. Oddly enough, I don't smoke, but I always am carrying around a cigarette lighter. And the reason that I'm always carrying around so there it is, I said down there, so I have it out. Uh, the reason I always carry a cigarette lighter is that if you are cutting these nylon lines, they just sort of keep fraying all over the place. But if you burn the end of them, then you get a good fuse on the end and everything that life is good. But the um so, so having those two things along is important. Another one that I constantly forget, but then I get reminded is a pair of gloves. Now these are really cheap gloves, but boy, do they save your hands. <laughs> I mean, when you're there pulling on those lines, there's, that's no time to be going, oh boy, I wish I had a pair of gloves. So, so be sure to have those along. I do have, uh, a kit that I carry around that has way, way more stuff than I actually need for most of this. But in, importantly, it's got electrical tape and, uh, and things like that in it. But the electrical tape is always a good thing to have. Uh, things like wire ties, things like that. And I'm gonna pull this out of the, the end here and show you a little bit about waterproofing stuff. Um, so the... Uh, you can see what other tools that I'm in for. Uh, yeah. Oh, the other thing also is that very often the line you first get over the top of a tree is going to be something like monofilament fishing line. Well, you take monofilament fishing line and hook it to a big long piece of rope and try to haul it up over the tree. Well, the next thing you know, you got a broken fishing line. So you need something that's intermediate. Uh, I tend to use, uh, this is a, a um, actually a basin line. They also make arborist line and sort of it's a bit thicker, a bit stronger. You certainly wouldn't want to hang your antenna by it, but it's enough to pull the nylon lines over. And we have another suggestion here. String turn line. So, String turn line, yes. Yeah. Cheap. Okay. Strong. Easy. Yeah, always work. The, uh, and the, that's sort of your basic gear for doing the, the hanging there. So the uh, getting lines over the trees. What if yeah. are, are members, I know the that goal guy. is to have your antenna <laughs> as high as possible. Yeah. And preferably if your trees 
geometry is correct, you'd like it so the broad side is northeast by southwest. That's because we have good propagation into Europe as well as the southwestern part of the US. And uh, in terms of getting up over those high trees, uh, here we have uh, have Jim with his, his famous uh, tater cannon. Yep, and, uh, and you can actually see the projectile flying out there and all of the, and all of the uh, compressed air shooting out behind it. And this is basically done by storing compressed air, releasing it suddenly and having it all shoot out. And an important part of it is this thing up here, the fishing reel that is, fought, is sending out that monofilament line that's attached uh, to it there. And the power lines are behind him. Uh, yeah, the power line is close and he's not, he's not shooting anywhere in the direction of the power lines. Yeah, and the, the, the nice thing about the, Jim, you can comment in more detail, but the, what I find the nice thing about uh, tater cannons is they're pretty aimable and they're very repeatable. It's like, okay, you know, I pumped it up to 45 pounds and that wasn't quite enough, so I'll pump it up to 55 pounds next time and that'll be enough. I can easily get it in the first shot as, yep. long, as long as the wind is not blowing. <laughs> yeah, and then and there the big problem is that he, his shot will go right where he wants it to, but then the line will blow away before the shot is, has come down and, and sort of contact with the tree there. And John, not, not to interrupt my will, um, is that the YouTube video is online on how to make, uh, your tater, how to make the uh, tater cannon launcher. Yeah. And, uh, and that's actually one of the club's most popular YouTube videos. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what's the I forget what the title is. But if you you it's, not, it's, if you, it's on our YouTube. Yeah, if you search on YouTube, it's on our club's YouTube channel. But uh, if you're watching this uh, video right now, uh, there is a YouTube video that uh, Jim did how to how to construct and built it at a meeting. Yeah, he was done at one of these meetings. I know. I will say about the only refinement I can think of is that uh, he's turning a handle here that does the valve and. One of the things that the about the only way you can make it inconsistent is if you turn that valve slow instead of fast. So sometimes it's good to sort of put an extender handle right, on it. So right. you can I have really, an extender handle on it now. Yeah, so that you can really crank it and boop, it goes all at once. <laughs> you want, to, want it all to shoot out at once. Now, there's a, a we have a competing faction in the clock. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. We have we have here a bow and arrow where there is a weight on the end of the arrow. That weight is very important because I personally have tried it without something that had a heavy weight. And what I found was that was a very good way to place arrows in the tops of trees, but not a good way to put lines over trees. Yeah, yeah because I, they do not come down. Yeah. And the construction of that weight is a uh that me the uh what I used for the weight was a brass plumbing fitting that fit, that the shaft of my arrow fit exactly through the hole in that brass fitting. And I used two part plastic epoxy to my carbon arrow shaft. And, and then what I used, I had, I don't know if you're familiar with those rubber vacuum line plugs. But that plug fit right into my fitting. So that tip that you see, if you look at the very tip of the red, that is actually rubber. So it's a little safety. It's not going to be much for safety. But the idea is it's a rubber-tipped weighted arrow. And uh, I've had a lot of success with this. I, I, I'm pretty accurate with this. And uh, it's almost near vertical because of the weight. Yeah, yeah, I, I tend to think of it as having more of an arc. The tater cannons, you yeah. have, I think, a little more range. In yeah, terms of this the, has very little arc. When it hits the apogee, it just, when it is at apex, it just yeah. right down, right through the tree. But it does take an expert to run it. Okay, <laughs> I got kind of got some other things there. A slingshot, I have to say, I have trouble with slingshots, and I can never hit the dark same thing twice. Wait, I mean, it, it, wait. It, they tend to go, uh, it's, a, it's a lack of skill on my part, or it's a, you have to be very consistent about how you draw it back, drawing evenly on both lines. It, it, 
Tom Sawyer was a was clearly a skilled guy that he could uh, could do slingshot. It's all I've ever used, but I, I understand they they do tend to be illegal in some locations. Yes, well, as are bows and arrows, <laughs> as are container cannons. That's which brings us to one thing that you can actually bring into a natural park, which is an arborist throwback. This is basically about 14 ounces of lead shot in a very sturdy thing. You um uh, you basically just sort of, um, I've got a loop in the line here that I can stick my finger through, and I'm not going to wave it very much, but I just basically just wave it back and forth and then release it at the apex, which I'm not going to try in here. <laughs> and I might add that this was the thing that had me buy the hard hats. Because sometimes, when sometimes, you know, sometimes, sometimes it goes right where you want. Sometimes it sticks a little on your finger, and suddenly you're looking up at everything. Uh, so yes, I and, and you do not want to be surprised by uh, a uh, by one of these coming down at a high rate of speed. There, it might be yeah. One one thing that's nice about it, though, is that you do not have to worry. About running an intermediate line because it's it's heavy enough it can take the intermediate line directly over. I can I can go right over with the thicker line, so I don't have to worry about winding in my monofilament to bring the line yeah. over, tying the line to it, and hauling it back over. It's just yeah. an over and back sort of a sort of a deal there. But that's and then what this bucket is is just a bucket of strain that if you feed it down through the hole in the top. It comes out just fine. Now, if I take it, turn the bucket upside down, shake it, not so much, but it it, it doesn't uh, sort of untangle there. But yeah, that's, a, that's a fun one. And then um, I have tried doing it with a fishing rod, with just a bait, just a casting rod. Again, consistency problems. Uh, same way with that I was having with sort of the slingshot. That uh, I'm not a big fan of that. If you're dealing with the, Something where you don't have, and by the way, this uh, the, the arbor throw bag is good for maybe 30 or 40 feet, but it's not good for 60 and 80 feet the way the tater can and the, the bow and arrow. Oh, I, I can tell you from personal observation, I have seen arborists clear 100 foot trees with those in a single throw. And I can't do it. <laughs> they do, what they do is a um, underhanded granny throw. Yeah. Uh, yeah, anyway. and they get it going, and it's an amazing thing to watch. Wow! Yeah, so there, there is a the thing. Perhaps a thing. There now, my, I had loaned out my uh, weighted lacrosse ball, uh, which uh, oh, it's actually just a lacrosse ball with a hole drilled through it, so I could run a line through it. That's a sort of a good weight for if you're just sort of doing like that to throw it over something. It's not too heavy. It's not too light. It's, it's just about right for doing it. But that hurts things like uh, we've got an event coming up this weekend. Some people have to be up on the hillside. They want to throw up a, a, a Slim Jim antenna. And what they can do is just take that ball, throw it over a branch 15 feet up, hang their antenna, and, and you know they're off the races there. Not ideal for HF work. <laughs> good, good, good for the, the uh, others there. Uh, now, one of the, the issues that comes up when you're dealing with uh, uh, wire antennas is a lot of them have a ballon in the middle. This is basically that uh, that white box where the coax usually hooks up and you have the two antenna lines coming out of it. And the problem is they're heavy. You do not really want to just sort of put tension on your antenna to hold a heavy weight in the middle. That's a very good way to break your antenna line or have to have a group also. Yeah, plus it, plus it causes group. Now, the ideal thing is that if you just put a piece of rope over a tree limb and have the balance hang from it, that's great. But that only works if you've got a tree in the middle. No, okay. Off center to die tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 I, well, what I mean is that by the, the middle, by the middle is, yeah, near, near where the ballon would be along the antenna. If there's a tree there, we can hang it from the tree. Failing that, uh, one thing you can do is, uh, is take and run a support line at right angles to your antenna. And so in this case here, what it's doing is this. This line here is just a line that only supports the balance. It's just a line, it's not an antenna. 
And then that's then supporting it so that your antenna isn't the thing that's that's providing the support. And I've seen that used in, a, in at least a, a couple places there. And that seemed like a very effective way. And then we get to my yard. Okay, mm -hmm. My yard's only got two trees. And so what I have done is I have one line that goes and supports the valum, and then I have my antenna sort of running running underneath it. It's uh, it's it's not not a thing like a use. messenger wire. Yeah, and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. and actually, both ends of the antenna in my case are actually hooked up to that line, uh, and it just sort of hangs below it. But it's not under tension the way the the top line. The top line's under a lot of tension. The antenna, not so much, because I don't want to break the antenna. Antenna wires are not as strong as your lines. So let's put it that way. So those are some, some methods for doing that. Uh, that is, because nobody ever calls them. But anyway, <laughs> um, and that's why. Uh, now, preferred line. Uh, the, the line that I sort of provided on your table there is not preferred line. That's basically a nylon paracord. Uh, but the, uh, the the better paracord, my understanding is the the, the Dacron polyester. That's what, that's what I use and it lasts forever. Yes. Yeah. And the the big advantages of it are that it it doesn't stiffen up. Nylon tends to get a little little stiff and yeah. stiff over time. Nylon also stretches a lot more. My antenna line, I actually. Didn't know that when I bought my line, so I have a nylon line over my house. And boy, when it's rainy, when it's wet, you can see the antenna go oh, down so bad. Then when it dries out, it, it tightens up again. But it's uh, it's it's not as good. So the uh, uh, the Dacron paracord, and usually three sixteenths diameter, which is roughly what you have on your table there, is is good. Uh, now, in terms of keeping the line under tension, uh, I some folks like the heavy-duty elastic straps. These have the problem that the straps can wear out. This is basically the idea that you're you want your line to have some give in it so that it doesn't like a bungee cord. Yeah, so this is like a, essentially bungee cord. And the other thing you can also do is get a you know five-gallon paint bucket and fill it full of cement or or something. And hang it from your line, and it goes up and down. You know, as the trees sway, it will sort of go up and down to, as, as you do it. Um, John, if I might add, uh, my two largest trees are uh, are uh, pine trees, and my antenna. I have a Carolina Windham eighty that's hundred and thirty five feet five feet long. Yes, yeah. yeah. they're all over the water, and what it does. I, I ran mine through my uh, way up high in my pine trees, and I just attached each end of mine to one of the lower limbs. Right. And so as the trees way. sway, the lower limbs go up and down. Like, oh, when you look out my window, when the weather's really spiritual, we got a big thunderstorm going. You can look outside and you can see the, the little bottom branches are just waving up and down like they're doing jumping jacks. And my antenna, my Carolina wind of is bouncing off the windshield of my trailblazer. But the antenna is fine. It's not coming down. And uh, we've had these big windstorms. And all I use is the actual branches on the bottom of my trees to give that that give, that relief. And nature's just... John, the brighter bungee cords. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, th th that's definitely sort of a, a way to way to do it there. The uh, So you're recommending the 316 polyester. Yeah, Dacron yeah. polyester. Yeah, yeah. The, the, well, Dacron is the brand name for but, the pumps polyester. But there are grades of polyester, I'll tell you that, yeah. because I've done some up in Alaska that were. Yeah, this, was, three, yeah. this was a suggestion from uh, from KQ9P for me, which is one of the problems is if you run, say that this is your line supporting the antenna, it goes yeah. up across the tree limb and it goes across. And over time, that tree limb grows a little bit and it grows around and it grabs that line. Your antenna is now a permanent antenna because you cannot lower it. You can loosen the line all you want. It is not coming down. Um, we, um, 
Bob and I, Bob and the Kumbi antenna team had tried to take down uh, one of Joe's old antennas at one point, and we'd actually thrown a very heavy duty line over the top of the antenna here to try to drag it down because the line had grabbed there. And we pulled and we pulled and nothing happened. We tied it to the back of my car and drove off. <laughs> And, and, it, and it basically ended up with breaking the antenna, the line, you know, the, the, once the tree had it, the tree wasn't going to let it go. So what, uh, so one approach to, to getting around that problem is to make it so there's one line here that goes up through the tree, but the line that's supporting your antenna is going up through a pulley or an insulator. And, uh, and Mike McPherson had recommended to me using one of these ceramic insulators mm -hmm. as a way to do that because it slides through and it never jams and it isn't going to rust that you know pulleys are, are picky things they they work great when they're uh, when they're started off but they're they they sometimes go wrong there's nothing about a hole in a piece of ceramic that i know that can go wrong and so you know you just Put the line there, and then the other line just runs up to your antenna through the hole. And so this line is always going to be free because there's no this thing isn't going to grow around it and grab it. Uh, so, and uh, you can do that to both ends or one end. Okay, you know, usually you can get one end of the antenna down on the ground. You can maybe do a little work, work. but anyway. Uh, I thought that was sort of a, a nice trick. And these things, uh, the, the insulators are very inexpensive there. Um, okay, the, uh, the, next, uh, the next step. Okay, you just saw, I just tied that insulator on there. Somebody tried to pull that insulator off. That's a bowling. You're not going to get that off. Huh? Yeah, not in a million years. <laughs> Don't be here, <laughs> Which brings us to my favorite knot. Okay, now, I, I did say in the announcement for the meeting, for those of you who were on Zoom, that you should have a piece of string or a piece of rope handy. There's a piece of rope laying on everybody's table here, and there's one end for each person. That's uh, right. <laughs> And we are going to teach you how to tie a bowl of knot. If you can tie a bowl of knot, you, you are good to go on many things. Basically, the idea of a bowl of knot is it makes, makes a loop that's a loop that doesn't tighten, okay? And the other thing about it is it's a knot that you can untie. Well, that's a, those are the two attributes of a, knot, of a good knot. You can tie it, it's secure, and you can untie it. So, We've got one part of the line that, uh, that's uh, running to the other person. That's the line that's going to be under tension. And then, so what you do is you take and you put a little loop into that. Which is a matter of which way? Make it make yeah. number six. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does matter. So then, and then and you like it so that the line that's under tension is coming out on the bottom. Yeah. Or the way you can do it is take your thumb and point it toward you. Grab the loose ends facing toward you. Grab the line with the thumb point toward you like this, and then rotate your wrist like that. Now you have the loop going the right way. Everybody get that? Yeah. Grab, you know, this is the running end, okay? So you're gonna hold the line like this with the running end hanging down. Take your thumb and point it toward you. Don't grab the rope yet. Take your thumb and grab it toward you. Now grab the rope. Now rotate your thumb away from you. <laughs> now, the running end, should be on the top of the loop you just made. Thumb, line, twist, running ends on top. And the loose end. So then, yeah, watch John. Yeah. Well, just then you take the running end and that goes running end goes up, up out of the hole, goes around the, the tight end, 
and then goes back into the hole, and then you just uh, and then you just snug it up. Yeah, the easiest way to teach knots is look over the person's shoulder. So if anybody, John, you can stand there. I'll stand back here. You guys can look over my shoulder. Because now you're looking. I'm looking. You're looking at it like I'm like like you're doing. Yeah, well, that right. Knock yourself out. There you go. Yeah, that's it. So so now we're gonna. Here's the running end. Right. Okay, right here. I'm gonna take this and turn it. Take my finger, my hand, yeah. and turn it that way. Okay, what so now it looks like a number six. Yeah. Okay. And the loose end is on top of the circuit. The loop. Now we're going to take the loose end, yeah. come up through the hole, yeah. just a little bit of it, not a lot of it. I, I think you then we're going to go around, around the standing end. Put around the box here, side, but and we're going to back through that way. hole after we go around uh, the uh, I, I, I've never done it at this point. The one that you can your loop. Yeah, there you go. You got to go away. Here's the part where you put the bowl. Just put there your angel on it. Now you got to fill I'm going to try that on the head. So, everybody get it? Yeah. Around the tree. You got to the same line as my whole scattered. Huh? If you're left handed, you can still. Same knot. And anything of this is just what I'm doing. Yep, just the bottom of the There's my six. Okay. Now, did everybody get the same thing? Thanks, son. Yeah, only way you can touch the camera. Yeah, now come up to the bottom. Around, around, no, okay, around back. Yeah, and then back out through this hole. Make this sort of small and hole. Then, I'll okay. answer. No, I'll make that. Make sure that this, this is a little bit of 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 a little did you get it? No, I can try it. I'll show you how to tie that. You got it. Everybody got it? Would you do a second one afterwards or one? No, you only need one. Yeah, and, that, and that's the thing about that's great about it. Is you tie a bowl and knot around. You're done. Like, you were done, and there's no problem. I mean, you can even. But why is the, the scouts? Because it does. And you've got two half hitches on a, on a line. Yeah. There. Which is a different, which is not a bowling knot, which is one that yeah. good. Insert out that way. Yeah, so here, you want to try again? Thanks, sir. Right. This is not part of the antenna section file. We don't have the knots and we don't know about that. Down through the bottom. Mm -hmm. yes. Any, if you run into any problem, any Boy Scout will know how to do this. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's this Boy Scout requirement is to know how to do a bowling knot. That's and it. then you want a good stopper knot, like a bowling and a figure eight, which is right there. Yeah. If so you I, have a bowling and a figure eight, the world's really yeah, I never had one else had a bowling slip even without the figure eight. Now, what, well, what, no, what I'm saying is one thing you can do on an insulator that I do, I don't tie a bowling, I just put a figure eight in it. Because then it sticks in the hole and plugs up. That's if you... Don't want to get it off again. <laughs> it's stricter not will come off again. But. Yeah. But the one of the advantages of the of the bowl and also is that even after it's been tight, you can work it apart reasonably easily. And that's not true of a, of a lot of other knots. Is everybody ready to go on to another another knot? Ouch. Yes. Because if, if you want to join two lines together, you want to use a square knot. And there you just take one end of the line, make a little loop in it, stick the other end in, and uh, and uh, and bring it back out again, making sure that the two ends are on the same side. If you make them so that they're on opposite sides, you pull on it, it just turns into a granny knot. And it comes apart. Which will which will not. Which will not give anything away. It won't break, but you'll never get it untied again if you pull on it real hard. Yeah. The only there's only one problem with a square knot, and that is the square knot will sell batch size. What do I mean by that? Because if you had a square knot, I'll tell you the square knot. You find a square knot, all right, in any line, and that line goes off of tension. This is what it'll do. Oh. So instead, it's much better instead of a square knot to, tie, to learn to tie a sheet knot. 
Yeah, because the sheet then will never capsize. But that's a different topic. I know it over sheet 300 band. knots. <laughs> And a sheet and a sheet band also has the advantage that you can use it with two different sizes of rows. A, a square knot, you better pretty much have the that is the that is the preferred knot. Yeah. And the other thing about a sheet yeah. band is it'll tie multiple types of line and yeah. multiple sizes and different diameters. So yeah. uh, but let me uh let me also say oh uh, oh, oh, oh no. well, well this is a, this one actually, some of the graphics didn't work out because the guy had to transfer between different programs, so it didn't do it. But one of the issues is a lot of times you find you know you tied your rope around the tree, you wrapped it around a couple of times, you got a <laughs> huge pile of rope laying on the ground. You do not want to be working with that end. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, uh, Bob. Uh, uh, let's see. No, let's. I was going to say I was going to have you be my uh, my tree. But I think I need Dennis because he's got the field day shirt. Oh, he's small and the rope something that's so big. But to tell you what, you can be the uh, you can you can keep the tension on it. So what you usually do is you wrap the rope around the tree. Let's see. I made this maybe a little short. Yeah, yeah, just just do your ball on there. Oh no, I'll tell you, which is square on. Okay. There you go. Okay. So anyway. What I've done is that they, here's the Bob. Here's my antenna, they, and, I, and so there's the, I can't do anything with this because it's tied to the antenna line. I then wrapped have wrapped it around the tree, and normally I do a couple wraps, but I've run out of line here. So what the what I then do is instead of uh, instead of trying to run this around, I I do a, a bend on it like that. And then what I will do is take it out around the tight line and then back in and then maybe do it once more sort of around the line and through. And that's basically doing sort of two half hitches with a double line. And then what I do is I take this the, the piece here, I put a twist in it and I drop it over the um, the um, the loop, and basically what I've then got is a uh, is essentially a variant on it on what's referred to as a trucker's hitch, which is basically means that uh, see now it'll slide down tight around the tree, but it but it isn't gonna but Bob can actually jerk Dennis right in half here, and the, and the line isn't gonna come loose. But, but these might see them without the thing. I'm not going to hurt that. Uh, like, once I take that little bite off the end right. and I pull on it, it just falls apart and I can undo it. Yeah, there's a similar knot if you want to Google it. It's a really old, old knot called the highway, highway hitch, the highwayman's hitch. Yeah. It was actually used to hitch horses. And there's a variant of it you can use to attach a strap to the end of a vehicle if you need to pull somebody out. Then you'll still be able to get your strap off the car. Okay, now Sorry. the lazy person's way of doing this stuff. Okay, <laughs> uh, I got these for five bucks at the at the ham fest. What this is is a uh, a uh, a hanger for uh, clothesline, mm -hmm. and what it has is this three ball bearings in that end, and it's got a spring so that I can loosen up those ball bearings. What I can do then is take a line, stick it through the ball bearings, and if I pull on the line, it pulls through the ball bearings one way, but it doesn't go back the other way. Because one way it's pulling it loose, the other way it's pulling it tight. And so if somebody wants to, to have a tug of war and see whether they can pull <laughs> that thing off, but uh, what's nice about it is you just, just push a little bit on the, on, or pull on the, um, the the shaft here and it releases. So that's a, a great thing for sort of tensioning things. Um, another one that I uh, that I like is, um, is this a, 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 I think they call it a, a number nine carbiner. And what it has is it's got a regular carbiner up at the top, but at the bottom here, it's got a place 
I've given out all my line here. Oh, okay. um, what you can do is it's actually got instructions that says, you know, do number one across here and then uh, and then back across here. And now it's it's tied. And so I have to use this in my backyard because I, I have to tension my line fairly tight. And it's a real pain to pull something really tight and then try and knot it, try and knot in it. So what I do is I make a loop that this can hook through, do it, and then I can pull this down to it and just clip it on and it's and it's done there. Okay, you can take a look at that. Um, and then they also have, I didn't bring one in because the kind of truth I have mixed feelings about this. This has a uh, a cam here that, that pull a, on a spring. And so when you pull on it, it lets the line come through. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure I'd want to trust a spring over lots of time outdoors. Uh, so I'm I'm a little less happy with that than the than the other ones. Um let's see. Now, the other thing I was going to show you how to do were a couple things with uh, with strain relief and with uh, with waterproofing a line here, but we may be running late, so uh, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that on a on a future one. Uh, the uh, but one trick I well I will mention the strain relief. Sometimes you have have some wires and you don't want them to to bend like that. You know you don't want them to bend too tightly. You want them to sort of keep a curve to them. That's why all of your appliances, you know, they all like a, an iron always has a little rubber piece over over top of the cord as it comes out of the iron so that it doesn't, uh, doesn't get too close to it there. But uh, Dave Damon had pointed out to me that what you can do is just take some standard wire ties. Sorry, find the hole here. Yeah, I'm not sure three of them. Take standard wire ties, put them on the thing that you want to do the strain relief on, take a little electrical tape, and I'm not going to do, do the full length of these things, but um, basically just, just take these to the electrical wire. And this is a, a very crude taping job. I would do a much better taping job in the real world. But but whereas before I could, uh, you know, for this part of the line I could bend it like that. I can't can't do that here. It's it's now got that strain relief. I use these on the ballot. Yeah, so put the two wires are pretty thin. Yep. And, and just wrap it like, like you just did. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And Dennis is saying that when you have an antenna wire coming out of the balance, sometimes you want to have some strain relief on that, and doing the same thing on those wires will work. That's there. right. You want, you don't want to put tension on the connection. Like right. The right. It's a, it's a, take a look at that. And then, uh, I won't uh, do the full demo on it here, but I will show you some. Um, if you're going to be having connectors that are going to be in place where they could get wet, and I work over on the eastern shore of Virginia where it's wet and it's salty wet, which is the, the, the killer. Uh, so, what you do. Is you have two kinds of things. You have your standard electrical tape, and then you have the you have this tape, and they come in a variety of sizes and and different names and so forth. It's basically unvulcanized rubber, and the thing about unvul unvulcanized rubber and, and similar silicone compounds is that they do not, or they tend to stick to themselves. And I don't mean stick to themselves just for, as in tape sticking to itself. I mean stick to themselves to the point that they actually merge. It's like they weld themselves together. But do you still recommend the old traditional handbook method is you first buy good quality electrical tape, 
then yeah. a rubber, and then tape. Yeah, and the, and the, the reason, reason is because you'll never get you'll ruin your connectors. You'll never get off the connectors. Yeah, yeah, you'll never get the reason for that first layer of tape is for tape is to keep the this stuff from sticking to the connector because it will stick to the connector. And it gets hard eventually. Yeah, and I've you found a useful thing to do is if you are if you do think you're going to want to take these connectors off. I will do the first round of electrical tape with the sticky part pointing out, so that that way. So that say you know, here I'll, I'll do some potting on this here. Um, I just sort of you know I'm wrapping this around, but I'm doing it so that the sticky part of the tape is on the outside. Now why is that? Well, I don't want it to stick to my connector. I want it to. It's okay if it sticks to the rubbery stuff. Anyway, I'm just so going usually to you get the electric to be scotch 88 tape off. Yeah. Well, what I'm doing is the opposite. Yeah, so you you can, but it's it, but it is easier this way. Anyway, th that's so that my first layer, what I was doing was overlapping by about 50% on each on each wrap there. Now the unvulcanized rubber, one of the things about it is that it stretches. It stretches a lot. And so what I can do is I can stretch it and then I can start wrapping it around what I've just finished wrapping. While it's under tension, you know, I'm pulling on it hard enough that it's still stretching. And now what it's done is it's uh, it's forming a watertight seal because it's trying to pull itself tight. And, it, and if I let this thing sit for a week or so, it's going to be bonded so that I could never get it apart in a million years. Um, and then what I, but the problem is that rubber is not really good in the sun. Rubber doesn't like the sun. <laughs> so what you then do is you just put another layer of uh, electrical tape, this time with the sticky part pointing in. You want to use scotch or a good brand. Yeah, you want to, yeah, it is, if you're, you're going to put something up for a while, you, because somebody was telling me how long does the average piece of electrical tape stay, uh, stay uh, on something. And the answer is three minutes, because mostly what it's used for is for covering connections for people that are doing wiring in houses. They throw a piece of tape on something, they attach things up, they pull that piece of tape off, and they they go go do other things. Uh, so good quality tape is uh, is a valuable a valuable thing to have. I'll uh, you know, pass. I have found if you don't do a good job waterproofing, like you're doing there. You better just leave it. Oh, nothing yeah. on it. Right. Because I, I have a number of I have a connectors in my line. I have no waterproof at all. I've never had a problem. Yeah. They're BNCs now. Right. And, uh, and if it was on the eastern shore, you would have now, trouble. Yeah. 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 yeah, you would have a big trouble there. Yeah. The other thing also that's really important yeah. when you do this is that you know, the time you do it, you move a little further out along the line. That's it. Because yeah. there's two ways things can get in. They can get in by coming in the side, and if it's got the electrical, if it's got the unvulcanized rubber, that can't happen. But it sure can run down the cable and sort of sneak in underneath yeah. it all. And also, so I'm seeing some old timers use heat shrink instead of the yeah. top layer of plastic. Yeah, no, that that thing. It, yeah, if you can, well, for this particular connector here, this is sort of a little uh, a little. Uh, disaster of a way to do connections because you don't want to have this many uh, adapters in there. But I do have a trick question associated with this one. Do you guys know the difference between a 75 ohm BNC connector and a 50 ohm BNC connector? What's the other? Yeah, into your pin size. Uh, actually, it has to do with a little rubber lining, and it just so happens that the, the this cable came with a BNC connector, and it's the 75 ohm cable. And then I've got the the little adapter here, and it is a uh, it's the 50 ohm. And what the food so uh, just. This is like look at the differences cable. between those. See how one of them's got a the little white ring inside, oh, yeah. and the other one does not. John, yeah. the one with the white ring. What's BNC stand for? 
Bulk cannot yeah. connect. Uh, yeah. Is it yes. bulk cannot connect? Yes. Because I was saying that something. No, it's bulk cannot connect. I thought it was bayonet naval connector. That that's a light bulb. Only in the navy. Yes. Oh, only in the navy. But anyway, that completes the uh, <laughs> the little primer on the things I know about the hanging wire and. <laughs> Okay. And so, is there any for those of you who have hung more wire antennas than I have? What did I miss? You got you covered it all. Well, I I do a ton more than you. <laughs> I probably not, but I, but well, I just I, I'm just doing Joe's. But again, I can again, I can yeah. experience things on what I've done. Uh, I started out with a slingshot, and what I found with slingshots, I know we're, we're going to be out here in about five minutes. I started out with slingshots, and I, what I the problem with slingshots was wind. I had a really hard time fighting the wind with slingshots. What I have discovered as a rule of thumb, rules of thumb, rule of thumb, is the heavier whatever it is you're putting over the tree, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you use a spud, spud gun, you're putting together a really significant the plastic weight. ones I used yeah. to use just bare. I've started putting weights in them. Yeah. Uh, put the lead fishing weight in them. And it goes a lot higher and a yeah. lot more direct. And I do, and I do, have, and I will say, so that's why I switched to arrows. Uh, but go ahead. That's what is one important thing I've learned is do this antenna stuff when the leaves are not yes. on the street. Oh. And I failed this spring because I said, it goes much quicker. I said, what the heck? But it started blooming already, yeah. and when it started blooming, it gets sticky, right? Yes. And then that messes up your lines. Totally. I'm on line going on. Right. So try to do it in the fall when the leaves are out, and it's the best. Yes, yes. Of and don't do it during a thunderstorm. What I learned, <laughs> what I learned in Alaska, is if the weather is really, really bad and it's blowing freezing rain and everything else, if you manage to get your wire up. You will be blessed. You'll have like an extra 3 dB for the life of the antenna because of the day you put it up. Okay. Now, that's not in any handbook or website, but I do truly do believe. Speaking about handbooks. First. Speaking about handbooks. Before we move on to that, I'm going to talk about field day really quickly. Hey, John. Yeah. Hey, John. Is, yeah. is there any way that I could bring up? Could you bring up the slides on your machine? Uh, possibly. I, do. I, I shared it with you on Google Slides. Okay, uh, to to what email address? Uh, your Gmail. Uh, okay, so so J two seventy. Yeah. Okay. See, so just need to have that share. Okay. I only want to show one slide, and and then I'll be done with field day. Uh, I just want to see if you have it because if you do, okay, I'm going to stop recording. Okay, yeah, that's fine.